right, all right. Hey, it is so great to worship the Lord and you've had a sense of it if you've been singing along. We are focusing on the holiness of God today. In fact, you grab your Bible and you can turn to Isaiah 6, a well-known passage that we're going to look at today. It has been such a joy to walk through this series uh, here at the beginning of our uh, of our year, this 2021, and all that we've gone through in 2020, and we're so grateful to God for how he's sustained us and helped, helped us to grow in him. Can you believe it? We're going to have one more sermon next week in this series uh, as, we, as we've looked at the attributes of God, the character traits of God, who he is, getting a clear vision of who he is. And then the next week, okay, that'll be February 14th, okay, Valentine's weekend, fellas, all right, be aware. Uh, that it's actually a Sunday this year. That is a new series of messages that's going to take us all the way to Easter. Okay, so this is we're all hopeful that this uh, this yeah winter passes and the whole you know the world opens up. But we're still praying and seeking the Lord in the midst of it all. I want to ask you this question as we begin: Have you ever met someone uh, who's famous? Now that might be relative for some of us uh, to, to how famous, who might that be, or in your sphere of influence or, or interest, you would think, man, I just want to meet that person, that person. If you've met someone that's famous, I want you to think about that for a minute. Uh, how did you act when you were around them? Like, like when I was younger, and I've had opportunity to meet some, I guess, relatively famous people, and you get a little nervous, like you don't know how to act. And you realize they're just human like me, but this, like if you met the queen or say a president, would you just like casually just, you know, go up to, what's up queen? You know, I, or would you, would you act different? Would you bat, right? Curtsy or whatever you do? Would you just be normal or would you be a little awkward because you're not yourself? And generally when we're not ourselves, that's a little awkward and it can be seen and it's hard to know. What do you do when you meet a famous person? And what happens then, okay, when you come in, in the presence of God? Do you ever feel the same way? A little awkward? Like we know he's holy. If he's the God of the Bible, he's totally separate than we are. We're sinful, so how? I don't just like come before him like I would anybody, and yet I'm forgiven if I'm a Christian. I, how, do, how, do you, how do we do this? How should we approach God with reverence and joy? That's what I want to talk about today. And you can imagine this topic here is bigger than I can handle in about 30 minutes. But I believe that if you listen to this message today and apply it to your life, this will change your life. It'll change your corporate worship. It'll change your personal worship and even your relationship with God. So let's dive right in. Isaiah 6, here we see God's holiness. And what I want you to see today, his holiness supersedes everything else. His holiness separates, his holiness saves, and then his holiness sins. Look at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now Isaiah, he places this in historical context, which is always under, uh, worth noting. We're, we're here in chapter six, so a lot has happened. Uh, Uzziah was the king of Judah, and he has now died, okay, clearly. Uh, but what happened before he died, uh, he, was a, he was a great king. Judah experienced a lot of pros uh, prosperity under his leadership and under his reign. But uh, then he became prideful, as often happens uh, with leaders and especially with success. And he strolled into the temple at one point to light some incense, which only a priest could do. And he was actually then struck with leprosy. The last 10 years of his life, we know historically, he had leprosy. You talk about quarantine. He had to be isolated. Imagine a king who can't really lead, right? They didn't have, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have social media. He couldn't tweet out things to the kingdom, you know, and tell everybody what to do. He was isolated. He couldn't worship. And so his son was a co-regent, but here's what happens. He dies, and then imagine, it was already a time of unrest. Nation was in disarray during that time, on a downward spiral, and, and now there's no king. Now everything is out of whack. There's no one sovereign on the throne, right? But watch what happens here. In this vision that, that Isaiah has, he sees God is seated on the throne. 
You see that? God is sitting on the throne. And, and, and where, is, where is Uzziah? He's down in the ground. God is high and lifted up. Uzziah the king is down, dead and gone. This is a good reminder for us all. Leaders come and go. Nations rise and fall. God is seated on his throne all the time. We talked about this last week. He's always on his throne. He's sovereign over all things. He holds all things together. He works all things together. He brings all things together. And this is true in your life today. Just a good reminder. But don't miss this. Isaiah is in the temple, okay? So this reminder that God is sovereign, that he's high and lifted up, takes place in a moment of intentional focused worship, if you will. He's in the temple. And so it's just a good reminder here for all of us in these crazy days that a constant weekly reminder of corporate worship coming before God with his people reminds us of who he is. He's high and lifted up. He's holy. But what does he see here? This is worth talking about. What does Isaiah see here? Because in John 1.18, uh, Jesus says, no one has ever seen God. No one's ever seen him. So is he seeing God? Because God is spirit. What is he seeing here? Isaiah sees God in a vision, but his holiness, okay, uh, is, is actually hidden. Uh, visibility is kind of hidden here as we'll see throughout. Here we're going to see th a throne and robes and smoke and uh, heavenly creatures. And he doesn't actually see God, but he sees his majesty on display, okay? But, it, but we will we'll never actually see God in the midst of all this. His majesty is on display, but God himself is obscured from the view that Isaiah has because he's so holy, all right? He sees him lifted up and his robe fills the temple. Now we have an awesome sanctuary that we get to worship the Lord in every week, but, but his robe fills the temple just to show how big he is. It's, it's like it says later in Isaiah 66, one, that the earth is his footstool. It's another way of the imagery that God is just beyond anything we can imagine. Now, the temple, of course, is the center of worship. It, it was the center of their lives because worship was to be the center, the central thing of their lives. I'd ask you, is it for you? Is worship the center of your life? And in the temple, you knew there was the holy of holies, the most holy place where the location of the presence of God actually was. Now here, he sees God, his glory filling the temple, his holiness filling the temple. Look at verse two. Above him stood seraphim. Now you may have heard of these. These are some strange creatures we come upon here. Each had six wings and two he covered, with two he covered his face and with two he covered his feet and with two he flew. Now this word seraph uh, in the Hebrew is connected to the word to burn. It literally is saying the burning ones. Now these aren't, these aren't little, little Valentine's Day cherubs. These aren't preschoolers with wings. Okay, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're seeing here is terrifying. Uh, what we're seeing is these wings. Imagine wings and then, then these shiny burning kind of something coming out. He's, he's rightfully saying they look like burning ones and, and he's, he's, he, he sees them. They're these, these huge flames essentially that are, that are going around. They're not angels per se because they, they're not messengers. They're, they're, as we'll see, you might know this passage. They're not going to give him a message. They're there to attend to God and to worship him. The hiding of the face, you can imagine, is to be in the presence of holiness. They're hiding their feet and some commentators say that's another way of of saying that, that their, their, their will is given over to him. It's why, perhaps why Moses was told, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. It's another way of God saying, I will tell you where your feet will go. I will tell you when you will move. I'll tell you what you're going to do. So their will is given over. They're there to be attendants, worshiping the Lord. Then it says in verse three, and one called to another, He's just calling out to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We sang that earlier, holy, holy, holy. Drawn from this passage is that great hymn that we sang. They call out to each other. It's a call and response, okay? Like an ongoing song that never ends and it has one focus, one chorus, one verse. Holy, holy, holy. Now, you might know in the Hebrew, doubling up on words is a way of, 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 of offering kind of superlatives, okay? It's to magnify something. 
Like we would put EST on the end of a word, right? The greatest, the tallest, the smallest. But in Hebrew, what they would do is just um, repeat the word. And I, I, I found this in a couple of spots. Genesis 14, 10, it said that they fell into very big pits is how we translate that. It actually says they fell into, very, they fell into pit pit, like the pit pits, pits within pits. And then there's another passage in 2 Kings uh, verse, chapter 25, verse 15, where the Babylonians are coming into the temple and they're pillaging the temple. They're taking everything. And it says that they took bowls that were gold, gold. We're talking about gold. Sometimes it's translated gold in gold. The gold is gold. But it's just in the Hebrew, it's the word. There it is again. Just there in the row. But only here, here's the point. Only here in the Hebrew do we see it three times. This is a category beyond categories is what is being conveyed. Holier, holiest is he. Okay, so first I want you to see that God's holiness supersedes, all right? If you take notes there in your Bible or in a journal, you can write this down. He supersedes. The word for holy is kadosh in the, in the Hebrew. It's hagios in the Greek. You may have heard that before, but it means to set apart. It means sacred. It means separate, sanctified. It literally could be cut off, spatially removed. So his, he is spirit and he is spatially removed from us and morally removed from us, right? His holiness, you have a hunch. He occupies a moral space that no one else does. He's perfect in all of his ways. So there's this absolute transcendence and his infinite purity. He's separate from all other beings. He's highest. And his central quality is his holiness. Now think about this for a moment. We've talked a lot about his different attributes, but it's not another one of his characteristics. Don't miss this. That's why it supersedes. It's, it's above all else or it's, it's in all. His holiness is the harmony made by the perfection of all of his characteristics. Okay? So as we've heard our beautiful orchestra and our choir today, if God's attributes, his power, his omniscience, his infinitude, his wisdom, his love and grace, his justice, if they were all instruments, okay, in the orchestra, God's holiness would be the symphony. All of it together. He does, he's not in parts. God doesn't have parts. He's unified always. He, he is holy, perfect in all of his ways. His justice is holy. His wrath is holy. His mercy is holy. He's holy in all things. But think about that. You wouldn't flip that around. You wouldn't say, um, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say, well, God's holiness is wrathful. God's holiness is strong. God's holiness is, 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 you know, is wise. Everything God does is holy. That's what he said. Everything he does is perfect. Never makes a wrong decision. Every action, everything he does, his whole character Everything he demands of us is holy. In fact, Thomas Oden, who's a theologian commentator, he, he said it this way, simply put. To say that God is holy is nothing other than to say that God is perfect in goodness, both in God's essential nature and in every act or energy or operation that proceeds out of that nature. His holiness is the essence of who he is. Think about it. If God were all powerful, but not holy, he'd be abusive. If he were, uh, let, let's say that he, he was, you know, uh, holy or all loving, but not holy, then, then he'd just be a pushover, I guess, sentimental. He'd be soft. He wouldn't be just. If he was wrathful, but not holy, then he would be destroying things constantly. You see how his holiness comes into play? If he's merciful, but not holy, injustice would run rampant if he's just but not holy then we could never satisfy him so his holiness permeates everything and notice it says the whole earth is full of his glory today on this beautiful day you're going to walk out I'm looking through the windows here it is sunny beautiful day don't miss this God's glory is on display in the Greek, the word is doxa. Now, this is a different word, holy. Now we got glory. Glory is an expression of his holiness uh, it, or all of his character traits, but namely his holiness in all things. Doxa is where we then sing the doxology, a song about the glory of God. Glory literally means weight. 
in, in Hebrew. Okay, it's the weightiest thing of all. It's like dropping a boulder into water and it displaces all the water. When God shows up, even as we see here, we're going to see here, uh, there's a quake every time he shows up. And there could be a quake in your spirit. Literally, there's going to be in the vision a quake, kind of an earthquake. But the sun serves as a good analogy of the glory of God and of his holiness, I could say. Think about it. The sun in our galaxy, at least, stands alone. It's central and unique. It's the source of all things. It gives life to everything in the solar system. It blesses and sustains life, but it can also kill you if you get close enough to it. I read this week that a teaspoon of a neutron star material would weigh, I don't know how they figure this out, but it would weigh about, uh, about 10 million tons. A teaspoon, 10 million tons. In other words, the intensity of the gravity and the intensity, of course, of the heat would kill us if we got any closer to the sun. God's holiness is like this. His holiness is, is, is beautiful and wonderful and glorious, but it can kill you. Not because it's so bad, but because it's so good. Because he is so good. Look at verse four. Look what happens. The foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. So the weight again of, of God's presence brings tremble upon the foundations. It trembles. We see this in scripture. The smoke is, is uh, really obscuring his very presence. If God is holy, then the question comes to this. If he's so holy, then, then what does that mean for us? Well, it means that he's separated from us. God's holiness separates. So it supersedes and it separates. Again, holy literally means to be separate, to be different. All right, God's holiness separates us from him. I think we all have a sense of that but especially sinful humans like us. And so look at Isaiah's appropriate response in verse five. If you know this passage, he said, woe is me. Now remember, he's a prophet. When prophets bring a woe, that's like a curse upon a people. He's cursing himself. Like I am, I'm done. I'm, you know, what we might say, to, I'm dead. I'm dead. I am done is what he's saying. I'm lost. Look at that. For I'm a man of unclean lips. Look at his response to holiness is just this immediate repentance, like confession of sin. That's what happens when you stand in the presence of holiness. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's why I'm, he's saying, I'm a sinner. How do I know this? Because I've just seen holiness right before me. I can say it this way. If you've ever come into the presence of holiness, you would respond in the same way. And I wonder if you've ever had a moment in your life where, you're, where God moved from a concept to reality in your life because you encountered him in reality. And if that's not happened, our prayer and our hope is it would happen today. Because God is beyond a concept. He is reality. And now Isaiah is responding to him. His response is spot on. He's terrified. But woe is me, he says, I'm lost. This is the same response that one would have who's silenced after great loss or even death of, of say, a loved one. It's Job's response in the book of Job. When he loses everything, he says, woe is me. I'm done. I'm just, I, I'm speechless. I've got nothing I might as well die. This past week, I was with a couple who had lost their 12-year-old son suddenly. And I go to the ER, and I'm there with them, weeping with them and praying with them. No words. We're undone. We're, we're just, we're done. And, and, and it's, it's, it's what Isaiah is feeling, this shock. But it's not just grief. He is in awe but he knows that he is a sinner standing before the presence of holiness. I wonder how often do you step into worship with that attitude, that sense of God's holiness. And if you're, you're tracking with me here, you're thinking, well, Jeff, if he, look, he's holy, but I'm sinful, then how can I even worship him? Hang with me. Look at what happens. Jesus says, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So here's what Isaiah is doing. 
Isaiah is speaking, yes, about his unclean lips, but it also reveals what's in his heart. It's a confession of an unclean heart. Isaiah wants to worship God, but he can't because God is holy and he knows he's not. And all he can muster up is, I'm, I'm done. I'm ruined. Have you ever experienced that in worship? So God just comes to us and we, we respond to him. How do we respond? How should we respond? Because you know, God is so holy, what we see here, and you see it in the Holy of Holies, uh, where God is so uh, holy that only the high priest could go in once a year. And even there, after multiple rituals that he has to walk through, these purification rituals, and only on the Day of Atonement, because God was so holy. The people of God, Judah, the, people of, the, the Hebrew people understood his holiness. I was speaking one time at a, an event and I said Yahweh in the midst of my talk. We talk about Yahweh, I am, the great I am. After, the, after I talked, uh, a Jewish man came up to me. He was offended that I said his name out loud, that I said Yahweh out loud. And you might say, well, that's kind of strange. No, that's, that's a recognition of how holy God is. And I think that we've lost that in our day. And so he's calling us to understand that. You see the dilemma though, right? None are pure. We can't clean ourselves up. We can't get our act together. We're far removed from him. In fact, Isaiah says this, Isaiah 64, 6. We have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. See, our righteous deeds, our best efforts don't get us closer to God. It's why in Romans 3.10, Paul says, it's why it's written, none is righteous. No, not one. And so we find ourselves in this terrifying position. And not only that, but God knows everything about you and me. Hebrews 4.13, when we come into his presence, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We should all be undone by this reality. But what do we do? If we're so sinful and he's so holy, well, the story even goes that when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, they would tie, this is not in scripture, but tradition says that they would tie a rope around him because if he went in and he had not purified himself of sin or he's living in some private secret sin and he dies in the presence of holiness, they just pull his corpse out. Well, okay, you get a new high priest, I guess, right? And in the same way, we just often casually just walk into worship and, and not recognizing that God is holy. But what do we do with this? His holiness supersedes. His holiness separates. But I want you to see this. To the shock of, of Isaiah and all of us, his holiness saves. His holiness rescues. It purifies us. Look at what happens. He says, I'm lost. He needs to be saved. Look at verse 6. Then one of the seraph flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. Now God, in essence, stops this call to worship or this moment of worship, and he brings his attention to Isaiah. This is a loving act. But I want you to see there's nothing uh, that's you know, special about the coal or even that it's burning. What's special here, don't miss this, is where the coal comes from. The coal comes from the altar where the sacrifices of atonement were made. The coal comes and then it comes and it, it, this is so powerful. Look at verse seven. And he touched my mouth. And this is so cringeworthy, right? This hot coal on the mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Now, again, I've read that even, I remember as a kid reading this going, this is so strong. Oh, wow. Hot coal on the lips would be the worst place. Why on the lips? Well, Isaiah's the one who mentioned lips, right? He's the one talking about his mouth. And so what God's doing is he's noting, I hear you and I am, watch this, purifying you at the point of your confession, the point of your sin. Now, Isaiah, I'm sure had a lot of other stuff going on in his life, but he mentions his lips and God says, I'll purify your lips. Now, what, he's trying to bridge the gap here. In fact, he is. And he's saying, come to me, come to me. I will make you, I will atone for your sin. You can worship me. But how does this happen, friends? This is what's key here. This happens only when Isaiah confesses his sin. 
That's what prompts God to him. This, this is why the coal touches his lips, why it touches his mouth, right? God is showing him, I can, I can redeem this. I can purify you. The difference is his confession. This is the key. Hold on to this. This is the key to understand how we worship God. There's no debtor's ethic here on Sunday mornings or anytime you come before him. You can't make up for what you have done, the sin in your life. You can't get better. It's what David understood in Psalm 51. After his sin with Bathsheba, he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. See, it's not our goodness that draws us to God. It's our brokenness. It's being honest about where we are. It's, we've got to do exactly what Isaiah does. Confessing our sin before God. Because we know this. And listen, if you don't know the Lord, you've never had an encounter with him like this. The wages of sin, the price for your sin is death. This we also see in the law where it's a separation of death and life. That you're, you're just separated from, God wants to bring life. Our sin brings death. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You don't have to be afraid to come to him because he has come to you in the person of Jesus. But what he's calling us to, friends, listen, he's calling all of us to be real in community, to be honest. We talk about this as a, a, a place where it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to come into friendships. It's what our groups are about, to come to know one another with no perfect people allowed because there are none. It's why theologian author Brennan Manning, he said this, in a futile attempt to erase our past, we deprive the community of our healing gift. If we conceal our wounds out of fear and shame, our inner darkness can neither be illuminated nor become a light for others. Friends, it's our confession of sin. It's not only good for the soul, but it's good for the body. It's good for all of us. See, God's holiness, it supersedes, it separates, it saves us when we confess our sin. And then finally, God's holiness sins. Our transformation is for us to then go and to live it out. Look at verse eight. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Isaiah immediately responds with, yes, I'm in. I'm I'm all yours. And friends, that is the only right response when we encounter holiness. And even this morning, God is revealing his love to you. You might say, well, if I had an experience like that, no, listen, we've come into his presence today. He is here in, the, in, in our midst. We are singing holy, holy, holy to the Lord God Almighty. He is speaking to you right now through his word. He's speaking into your heart and he's calling you, calling you to conviction and for you to re- repent of your sin. What is it for you today? What sins do you need to confess and maybe confess to others? It's okay. In fact, that's where God does his transforming work, but he doesn't call us to stay in the temple. Notice he doesn't say, Isaiah, this is awesome. Like the transfiguration, you know, with the disciple, let's build something. Let's stay here. And Jesus said, no, 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 we're going down. We're leaving this place. And here's what happens. He doesn't say stay in the temple. And I want you to track with me here for a moment. About a hundred years later, Ezekiel has this kind of vision, his own kind of vision. And you might remember it's a, it's a vision of water that's trickling out from the altar and it's coming over the threshold, out of the temple, down the steps. And he starts to follow it in this vision. He has water coming out of the temple and water, this source of life, this, this cleansing power it is in the old Testament, not fire, but water. And it's water coming out. He follows along. He's ankle deep. Then he's knee deep. And then he's waist deep. And then he's swimming in it. And everywhere this river now goes, brings life to everything. It overflows the banks and it's giving life to everything. And we're going, what does this mean? We don't really know what it means. And then a man named Jesus shows up. Jesus comes and he is the fulfillment of all of these kinds of prophecies. He is holiness personified. He's holiness in person, holiness on the move. He lives out the perfect character of God and morality of God in human form. 
He, he comes along and everything he touches, every person he touches is healed. He touches lips, he touches lives, he touches dead people and they come back to life. Jesus is the one who, who goes forth. Jesus, watch this, is the holy temple. He tabernacled among us. John said, we've seen the glory of God. In him, Jesus comes, the very location of the presence of God in Christ himself. It's why in John 2, verse 19, he says, hey, after you destroy the temple, it'll be, it'll be back up in three days. And then it says, and he was talking about his own body as the temple. He was the presence of God. And then he tells his followers the Holy Spirit is going to come. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now his spirit lives in us, those of us who've received him. So where is all this heading? He's pushing us out, friends, out of the sanctuary, out of the temple, out of our moments in prayer to be light, to be streams of living water is what Jesus said, would come out of us. And, and, and now we are the Haggion. In the, we're the holy ones. We are the saints because now his presence in us, we are now living our lives blessed to be a blessing. And then watch this, track with me. Where does all this go? Revelation 4, 8 through 11. The only other place in the Bible where we see it again. These creatures showing up. Everyone around the throne. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The song is repeated over and over. We're proclaiming his glory. But what's missing in heaven, watch this. There is no temple in heaven. Why? Because the entire earth has become the temple of God. Watch this. The earth, the new earth is full of the glory of God. His presence is right there before us and we worship him throughout all of our lives and all that we do throughout all of eternity. We are praising God for who he is in our new bodies, resurrected bodies on a resurrected earth, worshiping a resurrected savior. His holiness unveiled and even there, Ezekiel's river shows up again, right? Out of the center of it all. This is where all of history is heading, friends. And it's all made possible because of the holiness of our Savior who lived the perfect life that we could not live, who came and took upon himself our sin, our shame, our punishment, the fire, if you will, of hell came upon him so it would not have to come upon us. He becomes our substitute. We receive his grace. And the Bible says that he who had no sin died on the cross for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. His holiness now covers us as he redeems us if you receive his grace and you come to him and confess your sin. His holiness supersedes. His holiness separates, but his holiness saves, praise be to God, and his holiness sends us out. Let's pray together. I want you to think about what you've heard today, the holiness of God. He's calling you to be holy. He says, be holy even as I am holy. He's calling us to live lives of obedience, to be like him, that the world would see him in us and glorify the father who's in heaven. But friend, if you're listening to my voice right now and you, you don't know that you've had an encounter with God like this, you can give your life to him right now. Confess your sin before him. Just say, I'm a sinner. I am undone in the presence of your holiness. I am dead. And in that moment, God reaches down and right now he's coming to rescue you from your sin because Jesus has died on the cross for you. Just say, I believe. I believe that you've taken away my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. I give you my life to go and to serve you, and worship you all the days of my life. Lord, I pray that you would touch every heart, every person here. You'd remind us of your holiness throughout this week to come. And even as we pray, as we fast and pray tomorrow to give our lives to you, that you would move in us, remove sin from our lives, that we might live holy lives 
that you've called us to live. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. In whose name we pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen.